Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in. This is Code Talk, one of our monthly series hosted by Code CWA, where workers and organizers in the tech industry study and explore the historical, economic, and political context in which we struggle. Tonight we are hosting a Q&A with Jeff Rolowski, the director of The Social Dilemma, and we'll be talking about the important intersections between labor organizing and ethics in the tech industry. This will be a two-part Q&A. The first will be moderated, uh, moderate Q&A between Ted Wood, myself, and Jeff. The second part will be open to the audience Q&A. For those who are RSVP'd for the event, please check your emails for a link to join the call through which you can submit your questions. Feel free to send in multiple questions and at any point in the event. All right, let's get to it. So my name is Wes McEnany. I'm a campaign lead with Code CWA. Ted Wood, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ted Wood Strong. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am a, I'm a campaign organizer for Code CWA uh, based out of Atlanta. Awesome. And Jeff, uh, the bell of the ball here. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Rolowski, uh, he, him pronouns. Um, uh, I'm based here in Boulder, Colorado, on the ancestral land of the Arapaho, uh, Cheyenne and Ute people, um, the stolen lands. Um, uh, and I'm uh, here just grateful for the time. And thank you so much for uh, to Wes and Ted Wood for organizing this and Emma uh, behind the scenes right now and, and for the whole team here um, making space for this conversation. So thrilled to be here. Awesome, so let's get to it. So obviously in the social dilemma, you know, we touch on these big, uh, you know, multinational conglomerate tech companies and, you know, the ways in which they, their platforms uh, have drawn up ethical concerns. So in your mind, um, and as the filmmaker of this, what do you think the ethical responsibilities of these companies are? Oh, great question. I mean, I think that's one of the big things that we're just wrestling with in society in general right now, the ethical responsibilities of corporations overall. Um, and I feel like we are in, a, in an exciting time where there is a shift and a recognition and a prioritization that corporations have, um, uh, have to be accountable and have a responsibility for the impacts that they're having on society. Um, my background with the, the past films that we did, Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, we're all about climate change and recognizing, hey, look, corporations are having a crazy impact on society, on, on the world, on the planet. And uh, in many ways, I draw a direct parallel between the fossil fuel industry and the tech industry. We, you know, a group of people discovered a resource that they could tap into and, and profit off of. Um, and years later, they recognize, we recognize that there are consequences to that industry. Um, and I don't fault or blame the tech leaders or founders or executives for, um, for the past and what got us to this point. But now we live in an age where we are in an age of surveillance capitalism, where there's a new form of capitalism where we, the public, are the raw resource being extracted and mined. And we have to acknowledge that shift and, uh, and companies need to take responsibility there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's, uh, you know, obviously a huge, enormous responsibility on, um, you know, the, the owners of these companies and people in the legislative branch of the government. Um, but in what ways do you think the employees of the big five co tech companies can change this manipulative business model? Right. I think that's one of the big challenging things. Um, there are pressures that can come from within and there are pressures that can come from without. And um, in, in the social dilemma itself, we don't, our focus wasn't on the big five necessarily. Our focus was on social media and search. And our focus was on the advertising business model um, because that's where I see the greatest um, sort of uh, imbalance in power. You know, Apple is a huge company, but you still pay Apple for your phone, for your devices, for your laptop. There's an exchange where you're spending money for a product and those products are designed for us, the public. You know, FaceTime is a great, powerful tool that we can use that's built into your iPhone when you get it and you can use it to talk to friends and family immediately. Um, so for us, the focus really was on this advertising business model that I personally see as, the, as a real core problematic part of the industry. So that really is, that's the Facebooks, Twitters, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and Google itself, YouTube, but Google as a search engine itself. Um, and so the challenge is, um, how do we change this business model? 
where is that pressure going to come from for us to get off of this business model? I, I look at the business model as unethical as burning fossil fuels. And the fossil fuel industry could shift to be an energy industry. It's taken the environmental community a long time to push to see any sort of traction in that transition from fossil fuels and oil and gas to energy production itself. I think that's the challenge that we face with these extractive attention companies right now. How do we shift them off this business model? And it's either gonna come from pressure from shareholders and from Wall Street, which I don't think is gonna come anytime soon necessarily, um, or it's gonna come from the public or from employees themselves. And I think to your question, I think this is where there's a huge, huge opportunity where if employees internally are talking about, you know what, the thing that we're building has this unethical balance to it. We need to be building things for the general public. We need to get off of optimizing for the advertisers, optimizing for growth. Growth and advertising revenue, I mean, the whole notion of building algorithms for growth in many ways come from the ad model, right? Where the, the whole advertising model, and this applies to television as well and some forms of journalism where we count eyeballs and eyeballs and attention are the unit of measure and how many eyeballs can we sell an advertisement against? And that's the entire currency is eyeballs. And so um, these are really, really big questions and big challenges. It's, it's not an easy thing to say, how do we switch the business model for one of the most profitable industries in the history of money, right? They found something that is extremely lucrative. Our time and attention, our passive time and attention is something that they can monetize. Um, but I think that for employees at those companies, they can be asking those hard questions to, hard questions to their managers um, in all hands meetings. It's like this business model is not in the best interest of human civilization. It's not in the best interest of society. Um, and we have a responsibility to, to shift away from this business model. And what is that gonna look like? How do we build a plan? What's our one-year plan, our five-year plan, our 10-year plan? Uh, hopefully it doesn't take that long, but what's the transition plan to get off of this? Um, just like we need a transition plan to get off of fossil fuels. Yeah, so, you know, right on time here, you know, it was sort of interesting in the film, you talked to Tim Kendall, right? And, and he has a kind of a, I'm paraphrasing, but he has this sort of line in the film where he talks about trying to monetize Facebook as a director of monetization and looking at Google and thinking it was so perfect that they, yeah. over, you know, they, they ran a parallel line of, of the brilliant search that, dri that br draws people from all over the world with like an ad model that just prints money, right? And so, you know, if we're, you know, workers in, in creating internal pressure at these companies, what types of alternative growth models to mon monetization can these companies pursue yeah. as opposed to ads? Like, have, have yeah. you thought about different ways that um, that, that could be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a really, really great question. Um, the simplest and easiest in many ways is a subscription model like you have for Netflix or for Amazon or for your HBO account or Hulu, where you pay in direct exchange for the service or the content. Um, some people have said that that wouldn't work for social media in large part because the public doesn't deem it to be valuable enough to pay 10 bucks a month. Like they give it away for free because they can make more money off of it than, uh, than if they charged. And I think that goes to a deeper question around like, why is this something that the public wouldn't be willing to pay for, right? Maybe they have to think about designing the, the software, the platform in a different way to recode it so that it's something that people genuinely want. And I'd love to tap, like that's another part of the conversation around like what could better social media look like? But you have models of um, subscriptions. You have models of data storage like you do for iCloud and you pay based on how much data is being stored. So does Facebook store my entire history of photographs or is it a shorter amount of content? Um, you have models uh, like MailChimp where you pay based on how many people am I reaching um, and newsletter services where do you have an audience of 500 people or a thousand people or a million people? And people who have a million followers are willing to spend money on reaching and engaging those followers. Um, I'm sort of just rattling these off right now because these, uh, there are so many different ways that, that could be pursued. And to be fair, like all of these ideas have consequences in and of themselves um, for better or for worse. But the, the incentive at least is aligned back to the user. If we are paying a subscription for a, a monthly subscription fee for something that's designed for us, we are the customer and it's being made for us, the users. 
as opposed to figuring out ways to um, extract data from us to monetize for the purposes. Um, the whole notion of surveillance capitalism um, to profit off of the infinite collection of data from the public and to turn that, to, to render that data into something that you can profit off of. That entire concept in my mind is a, is a terrible path for us to go down. We're already really, really deep into it and we need to figure out how do we extract ourselves from it. Um, and the, the hope in, the, in my mind, we're going to get to a point where we need to regulate that where that no longer will be as profitable. And maybe companies will start shifting off of that model to get ahead of the curve, to build something and to be a leader that is not based on endless surveillance. Um, and I think that's one of the big opportunities that we have moving forward. But um, back to the question, I mean, there, there's so many different ways we can be looking at it, but it really needs to be aligned for the general public in my mind. Yeah, I agree. One of the the really big challenges that we're going to have is that, you know, with Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, like people currently see this as kind of like a town square, like it's it's part right. of their 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 ability right. to express themselves freely with free speech. Right. right. Um, but, you know, how does that work when it becomes just this curated echo chamber, you know? Right, exactly. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess my question would be like what what power should co corporations yeah. have in regards to censorship of users? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um the, the whole public square notion is an interesting one because we've heard that phrase quite a bit, but I've been starting to think about that differently. And that in some ways it in and of itself is just a fallacy. Like if, if we got together in like literally the public square close to our home, you could hear somebody standing on a soapbox and speaking, and then you could say, no, that's not right. And the whole community can hear a shared conversation. Um, in reality, because of the way these feeds are working, we're all getting our individualized Truman Show. We each have our own public square. So now we have an infinite number. We have 3 billion plus public squares that you get a, you can, yes, you can offer a comment and a response, but these aren't designed around deep, meaningful human connection. You can't have a nuanced conversation in 280 characters where the incentive is around like getting the most retweets or getting the most likes or getting the, the most emotional response. That's one of the things that we've realized with this technology. It's like deeper and more extreme emotions do better and negative emotions do better than positive ones. And fear and outrage are in many ways like the currency of the internet and canceling people or like calling other people out. Um, that is in many ways it's become the currency and, and I'm all for like holding power to account. There's value and need in that. But when you step back and look at, okay, and this is one of the things that um, I think I got from many of our subjects that are thinking about design of platforms as a whole, because they would often talk about like stepping back and looking at if you change a line of code, how is that going to affect 3 billion people, right? This is, these are experiments being conducted on all of human civilization basically, where you're redesigning at mass scale, the way billions of people are living their lives on a daily basis. And so to be able to have nuanced conversation about any issue, fill in the blank issue, whatever issue you care about, whether it's climate change, racial inequalities that exist, any issue that's out there, it is being thrown onto a platform and a spectrum that pulls to the extremes where extreme emotions do better. I sort of visualize it as like an algorithm is gonna look for any crack it can find in society and push people towards either extreme. And instead of going towards a shared culture, we now have infinite subculture with subcultures off of that where it becomes harder and harder to relate to somebody else. This is, this is what's really worried me where 10 or 15 years ago, if you tried to have a conversation with somebody that you disagreed with politically, it might be tough or awkward, but you can still have a respectful conversation. And, and it seems to be getting harder and harder and harder because we've been reinforced now over a decade plus of a particular worldview that's being reinforced for me and each of you and anybody else on any political spectrum. So to, to meet somebody that you might disagree with, you have to do so much work just to find a shared place to have a common, we agree on this thing. Can we start from this point of agreement for us to then figure out what are our nuances in, in going back to it? So the, the conversation around free speech is a really, really tricky one within, within these platforms. But as, as a brief aside, 
um, the First Amendment actually doesn't apply to these platforms in many cases. The First Amendment is about government regulation. It's not about private corporate regulation. And the um, so that's just a, a, a brief side note in terms of um, uh, those nuances there. But there is another part of the conversation where um, free speech is different than freedom of reach. And being able to say something and not being arrested or disappeared for saying that thing is different than being able to say something and have an algorithm with no values take that that little packet of information and amplify it and spread it and put it you know pour lighter fluid on that information without any nuance context um, or or understanding of what that means in relation to the bigger whole so these are huge huge challenges um, but from my perspective like what we have going on right now isn't working and how do we redesign our, our technology to be a constructive information ecosystem as opposed to a destructive information ecosystem. And I think that's what we're really seeing. Just like the fossil fuel industry is destroying our natural environment and our natural ecosystem, our technology platforms are just destroying our information ecosystem, making it harder and harder to understand what's true and what's real and how we, how we get good information in our society. I can like once you guys wind me up, I'll just go for a while. So rein me in and, and uh, no, keep, no, I keep think me in I, check. Yeah, I, I think this is great. I, I know in a pre conversation we had a couple of days ago, we talked about this point, but I, I sort of view what's happening with these companies as as a great example of neoliberalism, right? Where mm -hmm. they we we as a collective have somehow figured out a way yeah. to privatize and monetize right. human interaction, which is the most basic right. and normal thing ever. So. You know, in your mind, and you're touching a little bit, what, you, what should these platforms be used for? What would, what would be sort of uh, things that, that would change the world and better the world? Like, you know, mm -hmm. so many people in the movie talked about um, yeah. the sort of mythical uh, ethos right. of Silicon Valley. Um, really awesome question. Um, and just to, to plus one, the, the, the neoliberal execution of turning human, all human in, engagement into something that they can capitalize off of. I mean, that is kind of a, what we're living in right now. Um, so to answer your question, uh, I think you kind of have to throw out the existing paradigm of an infinite feed and what we're used to right now, what we're not willing to spend money on, but we're willing to mindlessly consume all the time. Um, in large parts because these feeds and these algorithms have reverse engineered what works well on each and every one of us. So of course they're gonna know what little nugget of information is gonna keep you coming back. Like that's literally what they're optimizing for and, and what they've reverse engineered. But instead, if you think about what would I want to spend money on? What would I want, what, what is something that would improve or um, increase my social fabric, my relationships with my friends and family? And let's just imagine and envision something like that where, okay, me and my closest 10 friends were connected through some type of platform that is bringing us together on a regular basis, that's engaging us in deep conversation, that's challenging our beliefs, that's exposing us to new ideas, that is facilitating um, big milestones in our lives, helping us go through challenging struggles in our life. Um, I have some friends that are, uh, I have one friend in particular who's in a men's group and he has a regular recurring cadence and pattern with a group of people that are close in his life. And we've lost in many ways, those parts of society. We've lost our tribal council fire. We've lost, uh, for many people, um, the church used to be that or for society that's been there for a long time. And I think many people don't have a place like that where they can have deep, meaningful, close family ties and friendships um, and, and those bonds. So imagine uh, a, a social media, a social technology that was deeply engaging in human social connection. I, I just pose that, I put that I, I idea out there as in like, please somebody take it and run with it and make something that I want to pay for that's going to build a stronger relationship with people that are close to me. And, and I can get my news from news organizations and not expect a news feed to be the thing that is reverse engineered all like literally my weakest vulnerabilities on what I will continue scrolling through because the goal is, is to just get me to see more ads. So I am personally, I'm really optimistic around this idea that there will be technology that inspires us, 
that makes you want to use it. Some example, I, I mean, I, I go to Masterclass on a regular basis, which is a great platform that I pay for to learn deep nuanced conversation. Um, there's a new social media platform called Clubhouse that's out now, which they're still figuring out a monetization model, but it's something that when I use it, I, I feel informed. I feel like a, there's a deeper connection to ideas. Um, so there are different ways technology platforms can provide um, content and, and ideas and, and inspiration to all of us that don't require the endless um, attention extraction model that we're, we're dealt with, we're, that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, I um, I just want to shout out that yeah, I'm actually going to check out that master class. It sounds like a really, <laughs> really useful, I've, especially yeah, for I've, user. Yeah, I've loved uh, master class. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, being that we are labor organizers, we're really focused on um, building power among workers in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and considering that, you know, a lot of those workers' concerns are based around the ethical use of the products of their labor. Um, and that has so much to do with the users in particular. Um, how do you see them possibly working together to change the lands landscape of social media? Do you see an intersection there? I think this has been one of the most exciting things from just this year, seeing where employees from different companies are fighting back against leadership saying, no, this is not the way we want our company to, to go. This is not what we want our climate policy to be. This is not how we want our um, algorithms being used. No, we don't want to engage in that government contract and that military contract. No, we don't want to um, participate in fill in the blank issue. So I, th I think it's, it's been incredibly exciting in my mind to see um, um, employees from different um, major companies and major tech companies saying, no, we have to shift our values and we want to be on the right side of history. And I think there's been a gap between recognizing the, um, the failures and the, the faults of some of the companies. I think, you know, in many ways, this film, The Social Dilemma exists because um, I was very, very close to the tech industry from college and many friends who went to work in the tech industry. Um, and it was kind of those friendships and, and that proximity that um, both gave me access and interest in the story in the first place. Um, but there was a very long period of time where I, myself included, I think many of us had the rose colored glasses on of, the inspiring tone and message of changing the world through these technology platforms. Um, and I, I think it went from those inspirational tones to now recognizing really the full extent of the, the potential consequences of these platforms. And now we're in this era where we're seeing those consequences and it's going to require a big shift. Um, like, like we said earlier, shifting a business model is not an easy thing. Right? And we've gone so deep into investing in this particular business model that I, I'm under no illusion that it's going to shift quickly. Yet it, all, it only increases the need to keep putting pressure on this business model is unsustainable for human civilization. I would take it to that level. Right? We can, just like we look at the burning of fossil fuels is unsustainable for human civilization. We need to get off of this business model as quickly as we can for the sake of our information ecosystem, for the sake of um, the individual mental health and well-being of teenagers all around the world, right? And I think this is one of the things that we saw in the making of the film, the consequences of social media and search and this business model and, and um, just the personalization of everything on the internet leads to these consequences at the individual and at the societal level across this massive spectrum that has countless different things that are, that are affecting all of us. Um, so um, for labor organizers, for employees to work together to figure out where are the opportunities for change, um, this is a very, very exciting time. And to figure out how do we put, put, put pressure from inside the companies to say, no, look, this might not be easy, but we need to do this because for us to be on the right side of history, we're forced to do this. And it's a matter of when and how do we make these changes? These aren't gonna be easy, quick silver bullet solutions, but I think those are the conversations that we need to be having. Yeah, I, can't, I completely agree. You know, one thing that I'm, we're sort of interested in, and, and, you know, I think you do sort of a good job in the film of, of trying to, you know, um, show what happens in real life due to these platforms. But sometimes we want to sort of construct the future to try to deconstruct the present. Right. So 
what, what worries you most about the future of society if these companies and these platforms continue to use addiction, you know, to right. monitor? Um, if you just look at the results of the election, not from a political perspective, but from an information and polarization perspective, we have parts of the United States that are living in completely different worlds. And we are getting exposed to completely different information. And so many people have referenced this election as a battle between good and evil, but based on what side of the political, political spectrum you land, you can replace whatever candidate for good or evil, right? We are in an extremely polarized point in American history. And unfortunately, based on how these algorithms work, I don't see that getting better in the next four years. Um, and, and to all of um, uh, uh, President-elect Biden's uh, attempts in the last couple of days to really make this a healing moment and to try to build bridges and to bring people back together, um, the pessimist in me feels that our information ecosystem will overpower um, his intentions and that we will continue to go down our individual filter bubbles based on, um, on how algorithms and, and these, um, these advertising-based platforms are feeding us different information. That's the thing that, that worries me the most. Um, and that's something that's, um, that's a death by a thousand cuts for, uh, for a country as a whole, right? With every single piece of misinformation that, that any individual sees, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you're on. Um, it's something that takes us away from being a shared country with shared values and puts us into our own little camps. Um, that, that's something that uh, I, I personally just find to be troubling because it's really, really hard to solve. Let's just take climate change as an example. How do you solve climate change if half the country doesn't think that it's real? How do you solve any issue? if you're, you're starting conversation with somebody that you need to find consensus with to be able to make any meaningful legislation where you're coming at things from just a, a completely polar opposite perspective. Um, the pendulum in that scenario is only gonna continue to swing more and more extreme where every president's just gonna undo the actions of the last president and we're gonna be in this cycle. Uh, that I just don't know how that functions as a, as a society in the long run. So those, I, I would say personally, it's the breakdown of our information ecosystem. It's a breakdown of a shared truth. It's increased polarization that leads to, um, as Tim Kendall references in the film, his worst case scenario is a civil war. And I don't want to like put that energy out into the world, but that's, that is a worst case scenario of um, just constant polarization. I'm looking for all the ways to build empathy and to build bridges. I've been suggesting to people to do a reality swap. Take your social media feed and somebody that you disagree with politically and swap feeds just to see what information they're reading and to get them to see the information that you're seeing and then have a whole conversation about how your information is so completely different. And to use that as a reflection around, well, wait a second, why is our information potentially different like that? Or where can we get better information? Or how do we find a shared truth? Um, so that's, that's the thing that has me, uh, I'd say, the most concerned. For what it's worth, uh, the energy's already out there. If anything, you're trying uh, to yes. reverse that wheel I, a little bit. So we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, watching the film, uh, I rewatched it last night, and I was struck again that um, you know, I, there are a lot of executives being um, interviewed for this. There, I think there, at some point there's a venture, venture capitalist who weighs in with his well-meaning mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before that you had a lot of connections uh, through some family and friends early on, you know, um, and that led to your um, ability to tell this story and the, the, mm -hmm. the impetus for you to tell this story. Um, so, yeah, just broadly, like, how did you how did you choose to interview for the film itself? Yeah. It yeah. Out? Awesome. Um, in many ways, Tristan Harris, who is kind of the main protagonist in the film, um, he was our entrance into all of it. Um, I knew him casually in college. And ironically, um, in 2017, when I still was a Facebook user, uh, I saw him post on Facebook about an interview that he did on 60 Minutes uh, with Anderson Cooper. And I was blown away. Like here is a, somebody that I knew from school who worked at Google, who is now publicly saying there's a problem with what Google's building. And I remember just like my mind was shattered. 
And I, I started reaching out to other friends who worked in tech, friends at Facebook, friends at Twitter and other companies. And I was just like, wait a second, what is Tristan saying? Is there something here? And I started hearing from other people in the industry and other executives um, and engineers that were affirming, yeah, I didn't get it at first. Like literally one person said to me, I didn't get this idea at first. And Tristan told me about it, you know, X number of months earlier. And I started to think about it and started to realize he's onto something. And I, I want to give massive credit to the many, many academics and others who have been studying and critiquing the space for a really, really long time. That was not my introduction to this world. My introduction into this world was through the engineers and employees themselves who were building the code and working internally and then saying there's a problem with it. And I was, I was feeling when we were starting to do the research and getting connected to people, we were sort of seeing people who were in some ways still drinking the Kool-Aid and then people who were reflecting, wait a second, there's a bigger reality here, a bigger shift. Um, and that was the entrance to the, to the film for us was really looking within the industry itself. Um, it was a very, very white male heavy set of interviews that we did through that whole process. At one point, we were even leaning into ma like making that an even bigger point in the film that this is a whole bunch of white men. Tristan calls it out as well early on in the film in terms of the engineers that um, that it was a very white male heavy um, community. Um, later, we started expanding into the academics and we started getting exposed to different ideas of academics that were studying this beyond the insiders themselves. Um, Shoshana Zuboff, who wrote The Age of Surveillance Capitalism was one of the major kind of backbones in that thinking for us. Um, but then we were able to bring in Rashida Richardson, Anna Lemke, um, uh, a, a more diverse group of people who have been studying consequences about the business model. And that's kind of in the middle section of the film um, where we were kind of expanding that perspective. Um, but it was, in many ways, it was Tristan's thinking that tied it all together for me. Um, and a lot of my thoughts uh, on this have been shaped by him and, and many others as well. But it, it's um, it's uh, one of those where one of the challenging processes when you're making a documentary film, there's so many people that we interviewed that we couldn't include in the film as well. So we've got, I don't know, maybe 15 people who we did long interviews with that are on hard drives um, that we couldn't work into the film. But um, there are so many brilliant minds uh, that, that are working on this. Um, and uh, if you go to our website, thesocialdilemma.com, we have a bunch of resources there as well to kind of continue uh, the journey and exploration if people are interested. Thanks so much. You know, you obviously are a filmmaker. You've been able to raise an incredible amount of awareness to all this stuff. And, you know, but we're, we're sort of wondering, like, what are different types of ways that workers can get their stories out, workers that have been working on this? Like, have you, have you thought about, you know, ways to, to put this in the zeitgeist um, uh, that workers could take action on? Um, great question. Do you mean, do you mean um, how workers can get stories from within companies out to the public? Or what do you mean? Can you just clarify that? Yeah, that's, yeah exactly. Um, that's a really, really great question. Um, um, it makes me feel like there's a greater need for a whole network of internal companies that are wanting to, uh, internal employees from companies that want to share their thoughts. Um, in one low hanging fruit opportunity, um, if there are ways that the social dilemma and our team can help partner, um, people can reach out to us directly via our website. Um, and if there are stories that you think might be worth us elevating and sharing, um, please let us know. Um, I think it's a really, really great question. And I think this is one of the challenges um, of, we live in a really, really noisy information ecosystem right now. And it's really, really hard to get your stories to kind of crack through. Um, uh, in, in the world that we're operating in with feature films, there's kind of a, a set routine around you make a film and you premiere at a festival and hopefully gets picked up. And, and that's how a lot of filmmakers try and aspire to get stories out there. Um, but we live in an ecosystem where there are lots of opportunities for short form content for different types of pieces to, to see the light of day. Um, I think it's just one of the challenges that all content creators are struggling with around how do you get your story out there and to get seen. One of the things that I think is really important for us is to also figure out how do you break beyond the choir? How do you get your stories beyond the same echo chamber that is always talking about a particular story? This is something that we dealt with very, very heavily with our climate work where we realized the people who were seeing Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral had watched every other climate movie that had ever come out. And we weren't changing people's opinions 
we were reinforcing in a really, really positive way, people who already understood the message, but we then had to figure out how do we do more with our films? And this actually is what gave birth to our team doing impact campaigns with our films, where in many ways, the goal and the objective was to figure out how do you build a wider and more inclusive audience beyond a particular um, echo chamber so that you can get more and more people into the conversation. I think this is one of the challenges that um, that lots of different organizations face around how do you get um, how do you get out and break beyond the choir. Um, there's no, I don't think there's an easy super silver bullet solution on that one. Yeah, I mean that was uh, kind of the crux of one of the questions we wanted to ask you. So I'm glad I'm glad you got into that. Um, I think we can start getting into some of the Q and A uh, from the cool. folks attending the, the chat. Um, I've got a really challenging one here for you, and I, you know, kind of interested to hear the answer to this as well. Um, isn't surveillance capitalism kind of an oxymoron? How could a capitalist system exist without constantly tracking workers and the consumers of the products they create? Um, that is a that's an interesting question. Um, uh, the thing that I think is an oxymoron is the idea of personalized news, but I'll put a pin in that because um, that is really in many cases what each of us is scrolling through. Um, I think the way Shoshana Zuboff is referencing surveillance capitalism there is less a matter of, um, here, here's the, the distinction I think. It's not the companies themselves. It's not um, the company that's trying to sell a product that is infinitely tracking. There are now middle middlemen, and it's the corporations that are the surveillance capitalists, the Google and the Facebook and the Twitter, that are collecting all the information about everything that we do online and capitalizing off of that. Um, and Amazon fits this description as well, and, and many other companies where um, it's figuring out how to use the all the nuances of our daily existence and our digital existence, whether it's your GPS tracking and where you go and what stores you frequent. Um, or it's which websites you go to. Facebook is tracking, even if you're not logged into Facebook, any website that you go to that has a Facebook like button on it is sending information back home on this user on this particular computer at this IP address is going to these types of websites on a regular basis. So it's tracking a profile around you, even if you're not actively engaging in Facebook itself or using Facebook itself. That same technology applies to lots of different platforms. So, um, I, I, there's, a, there's a great deeper conversation around the question, but I think in this particular case, it is a really new form of, of capitalism where it's not a product being sold, it's access to people like you that are being sold. It's access to taking all of the data that's collected about you and rendering that um, by a, a corporation, rendering that into something that they can monetize off of that is the unique aspect of time that we're living in now. So everything that we do, our entire digital existence is being turned into somebody's profit in many cases or attempting to in many cases. Um, so that's, that's I think the uniqueness of what Shoshana Zuboff was trying to say. Thanks. We're gonna sort of talk a little bit more about um, the political aspect. You know, Washington has been looking a lot at antitrust laws to regulate the tech. Yeah. Uh, do you think that these laws will be enough to make any meaningful change, or do you think you know we need new modern le legislation? And if so, you know what what types of ideas do you have? Yeah, um, I feel like uh, antitrust is hopefully like a good first step. <laughs> like it is by no means going to solve the problem. Antitrust takes Exxon Mobil and turns them back into Exxon and Mobil, and you still have fossil fuels being burned, right? Um, uh, it is not going to address surveillance capitalism. It's not gonna address the business model of attention extraction, um, but hopefully as it did with Microsoft many years ago, it's going to be a shakeup reminder for the companies that you can't get by indefinitely without regulation and that Washington is now starting to finally pay attention to the fact and the need that we, the, the, to the need of regulating these tech companies that have gone unregulated for most of their existence. Um, this has been one of the most unregulated industries. Um, and they've argued, um, you can't regulate us or China's gonna win, or you can't regulate us because you're gonna um, you know, limit new technology and new creation. And th that is just so far from the truth in my mind. Um, we, um, if we allow these technologies to continue in this pattern, we're just gonna continue to break down our society and the fabric of society. And there's far greater harm in that 
Um, and so we need meaningful legislation. I am very curious about what legislation could look like that in some way, shape or form outlaws the business model that makes this entire concept of surveillance capitalism obsolete, uh, that moves us away, that, that really puts the relationship back between the, uh, the company and the public, like the, the, the customers, we, we need that direct relationship here. Um, I've heard some people describe it as a three-sided marketplace. And when I first heard that, I was kind of taken aback and I was sort of confused. And I was like, but no, we're not equally, there's the three-sided marketplace being the company, the advertiser and the general public, but we are passive consumers. We're not, we're not exchanging in a fair exchange with those other two parts of the equation. And in many cases, the public isn't even aware of how the advertising world is working on these platforms. So we're the un unwilling victims in my mind of this um, exchange. And, and that entire thing needs to be flipped. Well, so to that end, um, you know, we've been playing this game since, you know, we were <laughs> since 1700, since we've had yeah. capitalism at all. Um, and, you know, one of the, the main themes, like you draw uh, allusions and, and al analogies to the fossil fuel industry, they have an enormous yeah. um, influence on our, our public, our, our politics, you know, for, at every level. Um, and so, you know, do you think an intermediate step or maybe a, a solution would be to break these companies up? Like, I mean, they are obviously too big, but. Um, yeah, I, it, it's a challenging thing in that just breaking them up, I don't think gets to the root cause of the problems, right? My, if I had a single silver bullet of like, if I became a politician one day, this is what I'd want to run on. My, I have had this idea for a long time that we have this notion in this country of innocent until proven guilty. And that applies to people in, our, in, the, in the justice system. Yet that should not extend in my mind to capitalist um, organizations where um, they get away with externalities. And I think this is the biggest singular theme in, in if I could draw a circle over the majority of the problems that I've been thinking about are the externalities of our fossil fuel industry and of our tech industry and things that they don't have to pay for that society has to deal with. And um, if I could do anything in my mind, it would be to flip that equation that corporations are actually guilty until proven innocent. And you have this type of corporation and we expect your consequences to be on this ledger here. And you can get your tax rebates by proving and showing your receipts that you're not doing the worst case scenario. And if you're a great organization doing great things, it'll zero out at the end of the day or even be better for you financially. What we have right now is a model where, okay, if you're a, a company and you break one of our environmental rules, maybe there's a slim chance that a regulatory organization will catch you in the act and fine you a small amount where everything in that equation is financially worth it for you to actually go and do that thing and to pay the fine retroactively. That's like financially the best move for you to do. If that's our society, and if that's the, the incentive structure around a corporation, they will always do that, that bad thing, even if they get caught, right? We need to flip that whole model. We need the fines to be bigger. We need the consequences to be bigger. And we need the, um, the regulation to be stronger such that the companies are incentivized to do the right thing on their own. That's really, in my mind, what government can provide. That is what the, the structure could provide to, to set up the incentives and the disincentives to make it automatic for companies to do the right thing. Now, maybe that's way too uh, the heavy hand of government for many people, um, but that, that's the thing in my mind around like, if we could flip the equation, um, then you can let the free market do its work. We live in a system where the free market isn't a free market because it's being subsidized by the government and by externalities. The, the, the externality factor is massive. And so, um, that, that's one of the things where, I don't know, in my dream scenario, that would be flipped. Um, I don't know how that comes to reality, but um, just once again, putting that idea into the world. <laughs> well, honestly, like that's, uh, it's not alien to us as labor organizers mm -hmm. because the idea is to have every worker thinking of their employer in the same way. You're guilty and right. until proven innocent. Right, you know? awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Yeah, my idea was maybe we could nationalize the companies and take the towns. Town Square back, but but no, I think this is good too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there well, is a conversation around treating them as 
public utilities. Public, well, just right. like that, water and electricity. These, right. Yeah. If this is how we're going to communicate, you know, then, then you know, we sh maybe should have public ownership of these things. Right. Um, but to that end of regulation that you've talked about, uh, you know, previous media, like what, what examples of successful regulation from previous media platforms can we draw on? This one's coming from the chat. Uh, chat. Telecom, yeah. they were severely limited on what data they could collect, monetize. Newspapers, you know, they have the equal access, access doctrine. Are there others that, that you can, that you draw from um, as parallels to the past? Um, the first thing that came to mind was telecoms and, and regulation there, which has been very, very meaningful. Um, in fact, the regulation that, that I'm most desiring of right now is the, the fairness doctrine, which we undid and we need to, in my mind, reinstate so that we are getting equal coverage um, uh, on different issues. Um, not that it was ever actively really enforced, but the fact that that law existed, I think, helped guide people and guide organizations to doing fair coverage. Um, the, the removal of the fairness doctrine, from my understanding, is what really led to the, sort of the, the birth of the Fox News era, where news had the opportunity to become very, very polarizing and, and, and um, uh, one-sided. So um, that would be the, the single biggest thing in my mind is reinstating the fairness doctrine. Um, just also on the, on the policy side, uh, we need to figure out a solve to section 230. Um, section 230 is what allows um, these corporations to have the benefits and privileges of being a publisher without any of the responsibilities of being a publisher. And they argue that we're a platform and we're neutral and we're not making any of the content um, which has been really their workaround to just let anything go. Um, I think that's one of the big failures that we're we're dealing with right now. Great, uh, Wes. Do you have any other questions you want to ask? I think we have. You know, maybe we could take one more here from uh, the audience. Oh. Um, you know, for as long as we've had broadcast content, magazines, TV, radio, we've had advertising, which also works to manipulate human weakness to change behavior. Is it possible the real blame is in advertising and capitalism more generally, rather than the existence of platforms that use it to monetize? Um, okay, so there's a lot in that question. We're talking about advertising itself, but then capitalism more generally. I definitely agree with the capitalism more generally part of that frame. Um, in many ways, uh, advertising is just a tool of capitalism. And in many ways, these platforms now have become a tool of capitalism. Um, uh, and so when you look back at what are these uh, companies offering, um, Facebook and Twitter and Google, in many ways, um, they are tools for advertisers, first and foremost, um, to the point where they've massively shifted the rest of the advertising industry. Um, I think there's a, a nuance in that if there's a billboard on the highway that we all drive by, we can have, it goes back to the public square conversation, we can say that's really messed up and that shouldn't be on a billboard. And we have values that our society can reflect on. On these platforms, I have no idea what Wes is seeing on, it, on the ads. I have no idea what's getting whispered into Ted Wood's ears every day. And, you know, we don't have the ability to have, and, and the ad is being customized to me in my experience, it's being sort of whispered into my ear and disappears. And I can't look back easily and see what influences were there in shaping it. And in many ways, the concern of this isn't the advertisement itself. It's not the rectangle that, uh, that fill in the blank company is filling in. It's the fact that these platforms are optimizing towards showing me an advertisement. Going back to the billboard on the highway example, um, it's as if Facebook and Google are actually controlling the highways themselves and directing Wes and Tedwood and myself to different roads, to different parts of town to see the different ad that's customized for each and every one of us. Literally redirecting and, ch and choosing how much time we spend. We can you know, send Wes in crazy loop-to-loops to see a whole bunch of ads in this one section and show constantly. I mean, this is what we tried to visualize in the social dilemma was this notion that you're in your bedroom and your walls have just become advertising space. It follows you around individually. You have a personal infinite billboard machine in your pocket and on your laptop screen and on your television. And like the ideal scenario is that you're on your phone, your laptop, your iPad, your TV all at the same time. We've just quadrupled our revenue, right? And so 
the the um, there's something very very different about this form of advertising when paired with the personalization through our individual devices. Once again, it wasn't the case when you had the family computer when all you know your whole family was on the one desktop where everybody was using. When we now are carrying our individual devices, it's personalized to each and every one of us. And then you're adding on top of that um, artificial intelligence, machine learning that is learning constantly what's working best on you. The billboard isn't constantly changing based on who it is walking by, at least not yet. And that's something that is a scary minority report reality that we might be going into soon, which easily could exist as well, um, which is just another scary notion. Um, but it is, this, to me, this is a very, very different evolution. It's not like a small iterative um, advance in weapon technology. We went from like the gun to the atom bomb. Like this is, uh, this is a big leap. Well, two things. First, the, um, the casting for that, that, you know, anonymous al algorithm that oh, you have yes. in the film, so great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Vinny yeah. Kardheiser was perfect yeah. for that. Yeah, you're yeah. really good. Um, and secondly, like, yeah, shout out to your own advertising on, on, on the walls of Ben's room uh, for Chasing Ice. Oh. I did catch that. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, that leads into this question. A little uh, Easter egg. Yeah. Uh, what's one thing that you, you that didn't make it into the film that you really wish that it did? Oh, my goodness. There is so much. Um, we, we had over 220 terabytes of footage that we shot. Um, if you're familiar with computers and hard drives, it's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, I think there were over 1 million words in our transcript document from the interviews that we did. Um, there's one idea that was probably one of the, the last things that we cut that I just really, really loved. It was this sentiment that came from Tim Kendall, who, who we referenced earlier, who is the former director of monetization at Facebook. He said that in many ways, the, they were admiring the Google business model, as you referenced earlier. And the thing that they admired so much, they, they looked at Google and at the end of a quarter, if Google hadn't hit their numbers, they could change little aspects of the code like change the font size a little bit and change the placement a little bit and generate an extra $100 million at the end of the quarter and then just turn the code back at the start of the new quarter. And it just blew my mind. It's like you literally could turn a couple dials and generate $100 million seemingly out of thin air. Like that is the level of asymmetric power and manipulative ability that exists on these platforms that like, little changes like that could yield an extra hundred million bucks. And that was something where like hearing that number just hit me. So we ended up not including it because it was kind of in a section of the film. It can be a really long and talking head. And I think it was losing some people and in the amount of ideas that we were throwing out there at the same time. And so that one unfortunately got cut, but it was this one concept where I was like, holy crap, like this is, that's not a nor that's not like Nike can't say, hmm, how do we make another hundred million dollars in sneaker revenue? you know what, we're gonna change the color of the sneak. No, like that's not normal capitalism. This is some like bizarre new power that the companies hold to be able to generate money out of thin air like that. And I think that was a thing that really hit me so hard. How are these companies offering something quote unquote for free that is worth trillions of dollars? There's a huge gap between what we pay and what they're worth. And that gap, th there's, um, it goes back to like, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And I think that's, that's really what I've come to in, in the making of this film. Some dystopian shit, Jeff. Yes, that's my, that's dude, that's my whole world. From the climate dystopians to the tech dystopians, it's just been a, a decade of uh, pick your existential threat. So I think we have time for one more question in here. And maybe that we just went really big. So now maybe exactly. we'll ask we can, for, yeah. for, for, more granular that, that uh, is, is coming conceivably from a worker here. Working on personalizing features for one of these large tech companies, I've found unsurprisingly, the dollar drives everything we do with users data. Yeah. How do you think me and my coworkers can start to shift the culture and conversation when the company has such a clear and large profit motive to engage in this behavior? Um, that's a really great question and it's a really tough one, but I would just, encourage you to, to talk to your, your managers, your supervisors and point out the flaws here. To point out, I just want to reflect, 
this thing that we're, we need to do is all about manipulating user data for profit or like fill in the blank. And it's not to benefit the user, it's to capitalize off of the user. I think that's the thing where we need to be putting pressure on whatever level within the company that you can. My understanding for some of the companies is that um, it is the senior product managers and the senior engineers and the, the, the people in charge of the platforms themselves that carry a lot of weight within the companies. Because if, if the companies start to lose those key people, um, the whole house of cards falls apart in some ways. I heard a story a couple of years ago about one particular um, AI expert at a company that wanted to leave and was offered a million dollar signing bonus, uh, not signing bonus, a million dollar bonus just to stay. Like, no, we need you. You're the only one who knows. And that's just like a tiny little trivial example that probably those numbers are like way out of date at this point. Um, because the, there are only really, there's small number of people who have the ability to know and understand how these algorithms work. And so getting to those people on the teams and having real honest conversation with them around like, are we doing the right thing? How are we gonna be, how's history gonna look at us? How do we put pressure? Like build your resistance from within and figure out how to have those conversations. Maybe the film can be an opening point. And maybe the film is like, hey, did you see the social dilemma? And what did you think? And maybe there's like a, cause I think some people in the industry are just like, oh, it's a bunch of BS and still in their Kool-Aid. And others are like, well, wait a second, you know, there is an honest reflection here of what are we doing? And I think those are the conversations that need to happen within the companies and to say, wait a second, what are we doing? And how are we going to be remembered? And what can we do from within? I am ultimately just on, uh, like, I, uh, despite the overwhelming weight and heaviness of these issues, I do find myself an optimist. I, um, there's a, a line from Jaron Lanier that um, it's, it's kind of in the film, but it kind of got watered down from like the full essence of what he was saying, because um, people in the industry used to ask him, why are you so pessimistic? Why are you so skeptical? And, and he was like, wait, I'm not pessimistic. I'm a critic because I'm an optimist, because I believe it could be better. It's those that are complacent with the status quo. They're the true pessimists. They're like, this is as good as it gets. And I think that was one of the things that really resonated with me around, we need to be having this conversation, uh, all of these conversations, because there's a a need and an opportunity for us to be better as a company, as a society, in the tools that we make, in the in the products that we make, in the offerings that we give to the world. And it's that challenge of how can we be better that forces us to ask those hard questions and to build a better system and to rebuild existing systems and to build things from the ground up or you know replace things that currently exist. Um, so I am truly optimistic about what the trajectory looks like, I think there's going to be pain and suffering in that process. And uh, you know, for many of the issues that we're dealing with as a society, there's going to be continued pain and suffering, human pain and, and, and for lots of creatures on the planet um, before we get to a better future. Um, but my hope is that um, the faster we can go through the pain, the faster we get through to the solutions as well. And, and it takes people wanting and proactive and eager to, um, to stand up for their values and for their voices that will get us there all the faster. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I'll add is that, you know, uh, it all depends on us working together. Um, exactly. As an individual, you can't, you can't do it alone. Uh, you need a vehicle to drive change and you can't have that by yourself. So. 100%. Okay. Well, this was great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here for the night. And thank you, everyone, for tuning into the live stream. Jeff, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with us and the viewers? And, uh, you know, where can folks find your work online? Um, the socialdilemma.com is the best place right now. Um, and our website uh, for our company, Exposure Labs, is exposurelabs.com. And that's been the home for all the projects and the, the work that we've been pursuing. Uh, I just want to say thank you all so much for, for hosting this and for having the time and space for this conversation. I'm so grateful to you, Wes and Tedwood, for, for sharing this. Thanks so much. Again, this is Code Talk, a monthly series hosted by Code CWA, where workers and organizers in the tech industry study and explore the historical, 
economic and political context in which we struggle. The Campaign to Organize Digital Employees is an initiative by the Communication Workers of America to support workers' organizing efforts in the technology, game, and digital media industries. Learn more about Code CWA and contact an organizer at code-cwa.org. And if you're you know, anxious in these political times and feeling like change is necessary, it might be time to form a union at your job. So definitely get in contact with us. Solidarity forever.